All right. Call the meeting to order. We are. Uh, if you please open us uh, with the roll call, please. Record the. Certainly, Mayor. Mayor Brightrose. Here. Vice Mayor Jablonski. Here. Council Member Albritton. Present. Council Member Hartman. Here. <laughs> Council Member Kaczynski. Uh, Council Member Kaczynski, are you here? We have a quorum, Mayor. Great, thank you. If you please join me in the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, very good. We are very fortunate this evening to have the Davy Chief of Police joining us, Chief Kinsley. Thank you for coming. Um, the, uh, we welcome you here, and I know we've got some good news this evening that uh, I know the council has been as uh, privy to, but I appreciate you sharing that with the residents as well. If uh, you want to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Mayor. Council. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> Deborah did it. All right. Awesome. Okay, I'll start over. Uh, Mayor, Town Council, Administration, Staff, Steve Kinsey, Davey Police Chief. Um, there was a couple topics that I was asked to speak about tonight, so I'm prepared to, uh, to go over a couple things um, that's happened recently, some of the things we've done in the last year, and that at the end, obviously, like, like always, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions that you all have for me. Uh, and like I said, it's a, it's a pleasure to be back. It's been too long, which is my fault, not yours. <laughs> but I appreciate the invitation. So one of the things I was asked to talk about is our active killer training. And that's something that is very, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, unfortunately, I was at the two biggest mass events in the history of Broward County, which was the Fort Lauderdale shooting back in January 2017 and MSD in February 2018. So unfortunately, again, I had that level of experience personally of being at those two scenes for over 12 hours and watching those tragedies unfold. So when I came to Davie on my very first day, I read the active killer policy because I wanted to make sure that the policy was laid out on what my expectations were in that type of incident. Um, and it was, it's because Pat Lynn did a great job, so I didn't have to change anything. But uh, <clears throat> that moving forward, I wanted to make sure that our men and women didn't just get the basic training on the active assailant, the active killer that they got in the police academy, that we, went, we enhanced that and we went beyond that. So I tasked the training division with giving that enhanced training. And in doing so, we, we've had a, a heck of a year as far as we make sure that every officer in Davie PD is trained in active killer shooting every year. Now, a lot of places you can't do that. We couldn't do that when I was at BSO. It was just too big. We didn't have enough instructors. But in Davie, we're fortunate enough to train every officer annually. So that's important because it's muscle memory. And if you don't use those skills and those tactics over and over again, when the time does come, you may forget what you learned. Um, so just in the past year, every Monday night from February to June, we did active killer training. Every Monday night. A lot of it was done at the local church on Flamingo. Uh, they allow us to use their facility. We like to switch it up and use different places because, as you know, watching the news, we never know if it's going to be at a school or at a church or at a supermarket or at a theater. So we're trying to prepare for all of those. Um, we also partner with other, other entities like Nova Southeastern. We did a big, big exercise with them and partnered with their public safety, which we provide, and their public safety officers. We had an incident actually at Broward College, which was a real incident a couple months ago that turned into a great training exercise and we were fortunate that it wasn't, but we did have a female in a bathroom texting us that she heard gunshots, and she was adamant, and we were trying to locate on that campus where it was Building 9 and trying to get to her. So for the first 20 minutes, this was a, this was a real active shooter situation at Broward College. Fortunately, there was some construction noise that she thought she heard, but we got to clear every building on Broward College, and it turned into a really good exercise that we could debrief, and we talked about how we work with fire 
and how we can handle one of those incidences. So that was one that wasn't even scheduled training. We've also provided training at the Montessori School. We do the JCC very often, obviously over on Pine Island, they're always asking us for this type of training for their staff. More than just watch and run, hide, fight the video, we'll go in and do a day-long scenario training with role players and things like that for them. Um, University of Florida over at Broward College and also at Archbishop McCarthy. And we've done that. And just uh, on October 13th, we partnered with the new hospital, HCA, there on University. And we did active training there with their staff and active killer training. So again, it's something that's really important. Um, and, and we knock on wood and hope that nothing ever comes to the town of Davie or the town of Southwest Ranches. But we're also realistic to you know we're in South Florida. And it seems like every bad guy, you know, has ties to South Florida at some point. So that's it for active killer. I, I, I can pause for a second if, if you have any questions about that or. Yes, sir. So um, when Uvalde happened back several months ago, I brought it up here, you know, on the day is what are we doing, which is kind of what the, the synthesis of this is. And I couldn't get past the front door before Detective Hobalis pinned me on the ground and was about to cuff me until I hear him out on all the training you provide. It's excellent. Now, we have Archbishop McCarthy and St. Mark's, which are, you know, right on the, right on the edge of town. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know where they are. But we also have a number of, um, you know, uh, parochial school daycares and any one of these scenarios, things can happen. Do you guys maintain a list of all the facilities in town so you know where you're going? We do have a list, and we, we actually are fortunate enough to have blueprints for most of them where we can provide our officers with the layout of these buildings. If we don't, we can get it. Okay. And the other thing that we can do is if any of these schools or any of these entities want us to come out and do that type of training, we're able to do that. Excellent. So we can come out and partner with them. And if it's, if it's a smaller school, it might not be all eight hours of a day. It could sure. be one hour. But, again, watching the video, Run, Hide, Fight is great. But it's nothing like actually having, having bodies on the ground. And our training staff and our officers that assist with training do such a great job with this. And they're passionate about it. So we'll, we're able to do that. Excellent. Because we have a, another large church way out west that seats several thousand yes, people. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, I've been there. Um, you know, I don't know if this has ever been offered to them. And that's, that's a prime location for the bad guys. But also I'd rather see the good guys understand it and, and be able to take control yeah, of theirs. So. I'll get with Jeff after this and make sure that we have a list of those facilities. Good. And we'll, we'll make sure we reach out to them. And if they want some type of training from us, we'll be able to do that. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Um, a couple other things real quick. Um, Looking at part one crimes, which I've, I've spoke to you before, those are the major ones, you know, the homicides and the rapes and assaults. Fortunately, Southwest Ranches doesn't have any of those really serious ones very often, which is good for all of us. Um, you know, we're always shooting for zero. But crime is down, currently it's down 5% from last year, which is still not the national trend, so we're a little bit ahead of the game um, because of the hard work of the men and women you have working out here in the town and the men and women that we have working out in Davie. So we'll continue um, doing those type of things. You know, we do regular, we do weekly comp stat meetings where we sit and we look at crime trends and we figure out if there's any hot spots, and we, de we dedicate our resources to that, whether it's our proactive units, enhancing road patrol, doing action plans. That's something that we look at. On a, we look at the crime stats on a daily basis, but we meet on a weekly basis, and it's, it's, a, it's an evolving thing because the bad guys move around. They don't care about jurisdictions, as we know, so we're just trying to catch them and put them away. Um, on that note, uh, I'm not sure if you know about the mail theft that we had a couple nights ago, or did you hear about it? So... Just to recap the story, it was 3 in the morning over near Sheridan and Flamingo, and uh, two females were walking their, walking a dog with backpacks. Seemed a little suspicious to Officer Suarez, uh, which is a good catch because a lot of times we might look the other way on that. Somebody walking their dog even that late in the night. He ended up stopping them. They had over 200 pieces of mail in their backpacks, so we detained them while we were there. The mail that had dropped them off showed up, so we detained him uh, and then got a search warrant for the car. We... Got in the car, there was a couple other backpacks in there. We ended up taking them in, got full confessions from all three of them. Um, we, initially, we partnered with the postal inspector, so they came out and sat through the interviews. And we ended up charging with state charges, but the postal inspector just had to make a couple more phone calls because obviously we want them in the federal system, which is a greater enhancement of penalties, of time. The state kind of looks at it like it's a theft, where the federal government really looks like it, they're stealing mail. And there's a big difference to us. So I talked to one of the postal inspectors today, and they are going to go federal on those charges. Uh, they're actually going to be back out here tomorrow to talk to some of the victims. But that's good news that all three of them confessed. We had the evidence. We got the search warrant. And now they're going to be in the federal system, which 
who knows what kind of time they could get, and they got to serve most of it in the federal system. So, Chief, good news they, on that one. Did they can uh, did they uh, um, talk about any prior activities? Because we've had a, an ongoing problem. Do they confess I, I know, to any prior trips and attempts? They have. They haven't yet, but there will be follow up interviews. The initial interview, I think, was to lock them into to this to what happened that night. Got but it. they'll obviously reach out to them, and even if they weren't the ones doing it, and I was talking earlier. Um, to the mayor, actually, you know, they might know other people that were doing it. And, right. and what we want to do is is get that word out in that in that bad guy community, bad girl community that, hey, you come to Southwest Ranches, you come to Davie and you steal mail, you're going to go to federal prison. Forget about doing two days in the jail or going to the right. state. And we want to get that word out. But there will be more interviews as we move forward trying to figure out the answer to that question. Thank you. And if they do, I'll, I'll reach back out to you and let you know. Kudos to the team. <clears throat> great job on Yeah, again, yeah. nothing I can take credit for. Just great work by the officer. And uh, being very perceptive and saying, hey, trust your hunch. You know, they tell you that when you're a cop. This doesn't look right. Let me, let me see what happened. And if it was just two females walking the dog, well, no harm, no foul. Yeah, Say right. goodnight to them and move on your way. So <laughs> they, were of his, they came from Margate, um, and they were Hispanic. So I don't know exactly where their, their heritage came from, but they, all three of them were from Margate. That's where their addresses were listed, yes. Yeah, I think that's so they're coming all the way down here from Margate to, to commit crime. So, yes, sir. Um, and the last thing, too, is obviously we're continuing, you know, obviously speeding is always something that we talk about. I talk about it with the Dave residents, and I talk about it with, with you all, with this body, and also with the residents. We're going to continue our efforts. Our citations are up. Um, we've done a total of five action plans so far this year where we just put extra officers out there. We target, you know, I have a list of addresses in front of me. I don't need to go through them, but based on what you tell us or what our officers that work out here tell us, um, we, we target those specific areas and try to get some compliance. Again, like we said, we know the speed limit's 25 in most places. 50 is way too fast in a 25 mile hour zone. Uh, last time I was here, you asked me to try to encourage the officers to get off the major thoroughfares. Um, if you remember, we always see them at Griffin and on Flamingo and on Sterling on Sheridan. Uh, I directed Captain Raven to try to get the message out that, hey, we want you on the interior roads as well. We have the residents that have allowed us to use their driveways to park and, and, and do speed. And I know the LPRs are gonna help. The, uh, the other thing that we're doing with the LPR project, that's gonna help. We just got 12 more with the town of Davie, too, uh, with a different company that's going to actually allow us to keep using the vigilance system, which we use now, but also this company does even other, does some more enhanced things. So with both of us doing that at the same time, it's going to be a nice collective effort. Um, we had an LPR hit today uh, at Griffin and, at Griffin and uh, Knob Hill. Mm. So right as I was coming from work at 515, a white van, stolen white van from Miami going east on Griffin at 90th Ave. So Excellent. That's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty much uh, the prepared remarks and things that I brought. But if, if anybody has any questions for me, I'm open to anything I can answer. And if I don't know the answer, I'll get it for you. Um, yeah, just a, just a couple comments. So first of all, I just want to reinforce once again, we just appreciate uh, your officers so much. They are, are part of the family here. They do an amazing job. Yes, they do. And um, we really appreciate their efforts. Um, for, the, for the LPRs, um, down, you know, they do it every Tuesday night from 6 or 7 to 10 o'clock, you know, and we provide some food for them and, and light refreshments. And they get, they get the gamut of homicide to canine to the mounting unit to crime scene techs. I mean, they get to see a little bit of everything, yeah. you know. They get to go down to the firing range, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I learned so much through that, that program, and it gives you such an appreciation for the challenge that your, your officers are up against as well. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an awesome program. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I appreciate you bringing that up, Bob. I, yep. I'd love to see that, us get more involved in that. Yes, sir. Awesome. Mayor, well, Mayor yeah. if, I, if I may. Yeah, sure. First of all, I, I thank the chief for being here. And, uh, you know, the mail theft case that, that I shared with you all yesterday, Officer Suarez did a, just an incredible job. But I do have one more story about one of our officers yesterday. You may not even be aware of this yet, Chief. But uh, Officer Rodriguez, who works uh, Bravo shift, he's on during the day, Andy Rodriguez, had not one but two life-saving incidents yesterday. Really? The first was we had a woman out in Griffin 345 with no pulse. He was the first on scene and began yeah. CPR until rescue arrived and transported. And in the same shift, then we later had a woman who was passed out, uh, apparently an OD, on the floor in Walgreens. He was first on the scene, administered oh, wow. Narcan, and... Uh, and, and brought her back from that. So Fantastic. in two shifts, he, had, he just that's, had an incredible yeah, day. That's and, quite a day uh, work. Yeah. It's not all just about writing tickets or, yeah, you know, right. driving yeah. around the Southwest Ranches. Well, We've got some great officers here. Life-saving. And I, I've got the police reports on those, which I'll share with you. But uh, And he'll be recognized as well, you know, for the life-saving awards. So. Excellent. So, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, know, Chief. It, yeah. it, it, the, the people in the community look at the Davy PD as our hometown police. 
the word Davy on the beginning, it's irrelevant anymore. Right. Because I think the respect has grown over the years and the professionalism is is beyond reproach. So keep up the great work. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've only been in this role now just over two years, believe it or not. September 2020 I started. But the partnership that we have with Southwest Ranches is amazing. Um, it goes both ways. And I just hope it continues for a long time because I think it's very productive. We have a lot of officers that like to work out here. I know the residents appreciate them. And uh, it's just a partnership that I value, and I think it's very important to continue. Great. Awesome. Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. The next item on our agenda is public comment. Do we have public comment? Yeah, Mayor, we have two tonight. Uh, one just goes by the name Gay. <laughs> and Newell Hollingsworth is the second and final speaker. All right. Do you want to speak, Debbie? If so, we'll grab a card real quick. Oh. Fill out a card. Oh, I'm really tired. Wait, wait one second. Fill out a card. Anyway, I really want to let the public know that animals are going to be stolen. They're on the hit list now. Davey had one taken. I had a ram, a seven-year-old ram that had been on the property for seven years, a female that had been on the property for seven years, and three new ones, one of which was pregnant. They took they fed them because they were easy to catch. They, most of these animals that are fed, they go right into the barn or right into the pen. They walked in the pen, they put the lock. I had a lock on two gates, the one at the bridge and the one on the pasture. They're right in line with one another. They both had locks on them. What they did was where the canal is, they pushed the chain link down. They then handed the sheep. Once you grab hold of a sheep, he just becomes inert. You can tie him up, you pitch him over the four foot fence, you carry him on your neck, you carry him to that spot, you hand him to the next guy on the other side, it's a three man deal. They put him in the trunk or they put him in, it didn't matter, because you can throw them all in the trunk tied up, four, four, four of them. I had two left two wild females who would not go in. They're brand new and I just bought them. So they departed the scene. That was on Thursday night. Today, at about nine o'clock, somebody drove up in a four-door truck. The owner who lives catty corner to the property called me in desperation. It was like at nine o'clock this morning. And he said, I took pictures, I took pictures. Of, they were there parked in the, and they had a ruler and they were measuring the bridge. And I said, well, that's a real ploy. They're trying to figure out how they're going to get the other two. It was real easy getting the four. So he has pictures, but they're not good enough. I would say I drove all over looking for a four-door white truck with a guy dressed all in black because he did catch him with the camera sitting on the back tailgate of the truck. You're just going to have to keep your eyes open, folks, because they're out there now. They're going to start slaughtering them on the site, or they're going to wind up stealing them. If they can steal them, like the sheep or goats, something of that nature, chickens. But the economy is, whether or not you know it or not, people can't afford the gas, the rent, and food. So they're going to get the food. And we had a horse butchered during a session like this out on 2, oh, 210, I think it was 210. Yep. And what they did was they just walked her out of the stall, down along the canal, and butchered her right there and left the, the remains. So I just want the town to know they're out there and they're going to keep hitting us until there's no animals left. Thank you. Great. Yeah, sorry to hear about that. I, I do, please, if you see anything like that, call 911. You know, it's good to take some pictures, but call 911. Get the police out there, and, um, and let's, let's see if we can make some progress. Yeah, Noel. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I was asked to, uh, we waved everyone out there in Facebook land tonight. So there you go. And uh, Noel Hollingsworth, 199th Avenue. Uh, just one announcement. 
Uh, November 15th at 7 o'clock, drainage and infrastructure is meeting, and they will be discussing the swale resolution that evening. So if everyone would come out that night, because at the last time the drainage and infrastructure met, they said, how come no one is here? And we said, we didn't ask anyone to be here. We thought we'd be nice. So this time, bring your pitchforks and torches, and if you have something to say to them, please say it politely. And... Uh, Show them what you mean about what the swales should look like. And I'll be there, and I'll see you there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Neil. Mayor, uh, final speaker tonight is Debbie Green. Um, I believe, and if I'm wrong, uh, please let me know, that, that the council or staff is going to pull item 9 from the agenda. Yeah, if Council Member Clint, Kaczynski, who is okay. on the phone, had, had some... Uh, some Perfect. interest in retooling that. Ms. Today. Green wants to speak on the dog ordinance, but since it's being pulled, she can speak as long as you're okay with it. Yes. Um, so we're gonna, it's going to come up. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll read it in. We're going to table it. Yeah. So would she speak now or speak when we... No, she could, she'd have to speak now because okay. once you table it, it's done. Okay. So yes. Right. Debbie Green, 5201 Southwest 199. So I'm glad the town is working on a, an ordinance. But when I, when I read through this first work of it, which I'm glad it's being pulled and you're going to continue to work on it, right. because pretty much from this, there's no difference between a dog, that get, a, a dog that gets out of their house or the yard because there's a hole or something else and a dog is out and about. And so according to this, they then be a nuisance a, what are they a dangerous well not a, a, no a, a loose dog but it called what are they, a, a runaway dog a runaway dog which is then a nuisance but in reading this whole thing then it gets to the dangerous dog the only difference that different differentiates between the loose dog and a dangerous dog is that a dangerous dog needs to be muzzled and on a leash when it's out other than that there's absolutely no difference so I can just tell you from my own personal experience, we had a yellow lab who was your typical Marley and me. That was his personality. He just wanted to play. That was his deal in life. Play with kids, adults, dogs, whatever. Now, if he got out, I mean, we had to close our doggy door because he ran in the, every time he got out, he'd be in the pool and then come running back through. But if he got out, it was, that was the game. Now, we made every effort to keep them in our house, in our yard. Sometimes the neighbor's fence gets a hole underneath it that you don't find until they're out. Now with him, if you chased him, it was the game. If you let him be, he'd be home in five to 10 minutes. <laughs> now, more recently, my husband was out walking um, out west by nurseries and him and my neighbor were viciously attacked by dogs. Like these dogs, five dogs came running out of an open gate of a nursery, surrounded them. <clears throat> One came from behind and really got a hold of them. I mean, you've all seen the pictures. It wasn't a little, a little nip. So I just, and I, as I understand, there's been a number of dog attacks throughout the town at this point, all throughout from the east to west. So I just think there needs to be more of a distinction of dangerous dogs as opposed to loose dogs. loose dogs who are for the most part as it says in here good and the owners make every effort to keep their dogs in their house in their yards and those dogs get out um, and as far as I think also what needs to be in here is also some time limit or time restraint requirements as to when when if there is a dog attack that you get the the um, vaccination records, so you know whether they have their you know rabies and their other shots. Now, in this case, thank goodness. I mean, it took a week to get it. Thank goodness these dogs at least they're cared for and they all had their shots. But there's nothing in can I? Can yeah. I there's nothing in here that addresses that. So I think I mean w this all goes through code. So I think, and also in my personal experience. The, the time in which I think a do, a, an attack, any kind of attack, should have more urgency from code as to reaching out 
as, as opposed to if you have a truckload of sand on your property or your bulk pile is too big. And I can tell you for the one time we used bulk in 30 years and it was too big, <laughs> we found out about it that day or the next day when we haven't used bulk in 30 years other than after a big hurricane or the other, and it took a week. First, it took four days to get any kind of acknowledgement. You know, and the, you know, Davey, Davey came, we made the report right away, Davey came, the email was sent, but then it took, I think, three or four days to get a response from code, and then however long to then get, just to find out whether those dogs had their rabies shots. And that's something that's, there just needs to be more urgency to that than bulk or any something else. So I just think, just keep all that in mind. And also in that the fact that most dogs in town are, they are good dogs and there just needs to be, it just, this thing went way overboard. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right. All right, uh, public comment is closed. Um, good comments. All right, any uh, board reports this evening? Good evening, Council, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, George Morris, uh, Chair of the Drainage Board. Um, we had our meeting uh, the other day. Um, basically, we talked about uh, the Green Meadows and Dykes Road Project startup, so that's very exciting for us. That's starting up moving forward. Um, talking with Newell, um, what he talked about earlier, we added to our agenda for next meeting uh, regarding the swales and slopes and detailed discussion. It's something that uh, we feel we need to go over again and um, give Newell uh, some time to talk and and bring something forward. Uh, also, uh, we talked about uh, changing the field permit process and uh, coming up with uh, more ideas. Um, obviously, in the past, we had uh, talked about it. And uh, we came up with the idea of having a big yellow sign and posting the permit to let the neighbors know that we have a permit. But we also got into a little bit further detail and discussion with regards to notifying, not notifying the neighbors once a permit application is submitted, potentially notifying the surrounding neighbors and affected neighbors uh, via certified uh, registered mail so that they're aware of what's going on because it's obviously a controversial thing in this town and we, you know, we're trying to educate and, and promote, you know, knowledge and information so that's something that we're we're going to be forwarded to council we talked about that we also had a small discussion on the definition of flooding trying to determine what's really flooding um sometimes people think my yard is flooding and they're holding a little bit of water and then you know it's really that's what their yard or swale is designed to do so that's something that we're going to try and work on as difficult as it may be so that's my report for the drainage board one thing I would like to mention, uh, the carnival, we have the carnival coming up on behalf of the Astor Knight uh, Foundation. That's coming up on uh, January um, yeah, over the Martin Luther King holiday. The first day of the carnival is going to be January the 12th. It's a Thursday. It's going to be about a half day. It's going to run through the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, continue on, end on the Monday of Martin Luther King, which is January 16th. So we're looking forward to that. Obviously, we had our first annual carnival, carnival last year. It's at the Preserve Park. We're looking forward to it this year. Um, it's going to be uh, quite the event. Um, and one other thing that I'd like to mention on behalf of the Astor uh, Knight Southwest Ranches Park Foundation, if everybody's been to this beautiful chamber of ours, we have a tree of life, I'm calling it, on the back wall there. Uh, it's uh, People can donate and have their names or their company uh, spend a certain amount of money. It could be $100, $250. There's different ranges. I know that December's handling that. Um, we're trying to get some money, raise some money that way, and that is a permanent fixture that will be in these chambers for many years to come. So if anybody's interested in donating, having their name put up there, it's a wonderful contribution to the town. We would greatly appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the Historical Society had nominated Josh Dykes and they made the presentation. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go. I was going to go with him and my grandson got married that day. So I tossed the coin and kicked Josh to the curb. And uh, But he had a nice time. He went there and it was at Wilton Manors. And I had approached our town administrator on uh, contacting them and sponsoring the next one here in the town. 
So he was, and I are going to get together on that. Um, but I think we can do a really good job, and I think it's about time we did it. it they've been doing this for 20-some-odd years, and we've had about, I think, eight recipients so far. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Kay. I was, uh, had the opportunity to also be down there when Josh got the award, and it was, it's a good ceremony, and he did a great job there. So uh, it, was, it was great, great to see that recognition. All right, any more board reports? Seeing none, uh, let's see. Council member comments. Yeah, I'll go, Mayor. All right, uh, very good, thank you. Permitted, um, thank everybody for coming. How many do we have on uh, YouTube? Seven, great, All right. outstanding. Good. I, know, I know two of them, Rose and Kathy. Kathy, <laughs> <laughs> too. Oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> and David. And David. <laughs> uh, anyway, I have a few items to go through here. Uh, that I'd like to uh, cover. So, but anyway, thank thank you all for your comments earlier, and um, I'll get right into the meat and potatoes of it. Um, just some FYI stuff. Uh, there's no no more flowmobile until the West Coast gets itself uh, back together. They're using all the resources from all over the state to get uh, Southwest Florida back up because a lot of people lost everything, as we all know, driver's licenses, marriage certificates, whatever is somewhere out in the Gulf of Mexico and probably in tatters. And so they're trying to put everything back together as best they can. Um, the Rolling Oaks Halloween uh, trick, trick or trunk, trunk or trick, uh, is the 29th of uh, this week. It's uh, this Saturday night from 6 to 9. Bring candy, set up a little table, put some Halloween lights out, uh, have your kids dressed up. It's a lot of fun. Meet your neighbors. Um, nobody's checking adult beverages. Everything's great. You know, we have a great time on it. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, um, Bob, Nancy is graciously uh, putting out popcorn that Roka is providing, uh, and she does a wonderful job for it. My job is to keep her, to help her, and keep her hydrated and all other good stuff. So, oh, I, I, I have my job uh, going with that. Um, just an, another item of note of the Education Advisory Board. We have a book drive going uh, through November all the way till December 1st. It uh, deals with elementary books, gently used elementary books if you have them. You're, you know, a lot, of, a lot of parents, their kids are already gone. If you've got the books laying around, bring them to town hall. We have a box for them. Uh, they get donated to uh, the local elementary schools. Uh, the Broward County P, uh, uh, Property Appraisers, November 1st from uh, 10 to 10 to 12, that would be this coming uh, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, we have a food truck event with the uh, Education Advisory Board at Hawks Bluff, uh, with Hawks Bluff at the Equestrian Park on uh, the 5th of uh, November from 5 to 9. It's a lot of fun. Come out and see all the kids. Live music and uh, uh, a lot of good eats going on there. November 11th is Veterans Day. The town hall is closed. We're honoring all our veterans. We have uh, a great deal of veterans in our town, and and uh, wish we wish we had a list we could name them all. But of course, the danger of that is that you leave somebody off, and uh, we're just all we're just all glad that they've uh, that they're here. Um, November seventeenth is going to be the only town council meeting for November, uh, for the three month period of November, December, and January. We only have one scheduled meeting. We can schedule more if it's if something comes up storm uh, hurricane whatever uh so it's it's possible that we could schedule more if we if we so desire but we're going to only have the one on the 17th on uh, november 24th and 25th uh, town hall will be closed for thanksgiving that's thursday and friday we'll open up the, the next monday um now i want to get into something that we've been talking about um russell if you can queue up some of those pictures of uh, um, and, and Russell's going to run a montage of pictures we took, and this is going to be trash talk, uh, literally. Uh, the first thing I want to uh, mention is on our um, bulk pickup, we, we didn't do such a great job on the, on the maps because the maps went out before we discovered that we had a minor problem, and that was there was four major streets where the, they were used as a dividing line for the bulk pickup where there would be a bulk pickup on either the left side or the right side of the street 
uh, all week long, every week, 52 weeks out of the year. So we tried to straighten that back out. And it's uh, just to list them, it's uh, 202 is in zone 9, the entire street, both sides, east and west. Um, 190th is in zone 3, both sides, east and west. 178th is zone 8 on both sides, east and west. And this is just the only the street. Everything uh, uh, west of that is into a different zone. And then Hancock Road is zone 10, both sides of, of Hancock Road. And there seems to be some confusion regarding that. It only deals with the street. Um, we put it out on the map, and the map could probably be drawn a little bit better because everybody was trying to extrapolate out another block or two out of it. And it was, it was, creating, it was creating some problems. So hopefully I've... I haven't confused everybody, and <laughs> everybody uh, understand, understands what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Um, we did a ride-along, several of us, uh, where we actually rode with the uh, drivers on the trucks to see what, what happens um, th this week. Uh, and I found it very interesting. I was on the truck for about an hour and a half. We did uh, Christie's Ranches and uh, 195th and 196th. And um, those, uh, I was very impressed uh, with the trucks. Uh, I now know what it's like to drive in, a, in an M1, M1 Abrams tank at high speed, because <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite a ride. The driver was, was wonderful. He was showing us everything, uh, how everything worked. Um, uh, it, the, it's a one-man operation, and they take safety very seriously there. And the, um, the, the, where the driver sits, it looks like a, a cockpit of an F-16. I mean, I, I can't describe it to you any better than that. Cameras, monitors, everything under the sun is there. Um, but I, I did pick up on some interesting stuff. And, of course, there's a learning curve here amongst, and the learning curve occurs with the company and with the residents. But some of the stuff that I'd like to mention to help the residents, um, when about, I would say about on the run I was on, and this was just the run I was on, about 20% of the trash, the trash bins we're right next to either each other or a mailbox. And he has to go out with like five, five foot claws and he has to move those, those cans and then get around them to, uh, to dump them. And so I thought that was, uh, everybody needs to kind of maintain that separation uh, as they go along. The, um, some, some of the uh, approved trash cans over here were uh, strapped down with bungee cords which means the driver had to stop. Now, normally they're supposed to bypass them if they can't access them, but the driver being new, you know, everybody being new, the driver went and went out, got out of the car, and then out of the car, got out of the truck, undid the bungee cords and everything so that they could be properly dumped. You know, going, they're going the extra inch, extra mile, wherever they can, but um, residents, please don't strap down your, uh, your tops. Um, also, uh, something interesting I learned, is we, we talk about where they put everything forward uh, with the arrows and uh, so that the, they're facing out to the street. Well, they can empty them backwards, and they no, they emptied a number of them backwards. The the problem is, and it, this is where it'll fall onto the uh, resident, is the lid won't close. And so if it's a rainy day, you're going to be lugging you know uh, several gallons of water. You're going to have to be tipping it over and and the whatnot. So if you put the the arrows out. The lid, they'll close the lid and it'll all come back down on you. Um, the drivers do not make U-turns. That's real important. They go up and they go back up and down the street. They are not allowed to make a U-turn into a driveway. Uh, when they go down a cul-de-sac, they come back out and then they go back down another way and they turn, they turn around, they're going down the street and then they back in to get to the other side of the cul-de-sac. It's, it's quite interesting how they, how they do that, but they do it very quickly. And I was kind of, I was very impressed on that. So, uh, but naturally they're, 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 they're shining the, you know, when, when we're riding, when they're doing their best, but they were doing a pretty good job. Um, the, a lot of people are still using the older style bends that they bought, that look similar to that, that they bought at Home Depot. Those are not being picked up. I s probably saw maybe 20, 30 of them out there. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Don't use them. If you don't, if you don't want them, bring them over here to town hall. We're going to try to recycle them here, or keep them and use them on your property for other purposes. Um, but they will not be picking those up. And I asked him why they couldn't pick them up. I asked the driver that, and he gave me a very interesting explanation. Some people need to hear this, um, and it also deals with the round, gray, brute trash cans. When they, 
they can't get the arm around it properly. And when they raise it up, it falls out. And it falls into the container, which is compacting. And what happens, you see, the way he explained it to me was, when a trash can falls in, they, they assume it's a contaminated load. He has to stop the truck. He has a special lock, he showed it to me, that he has with a, with a tag on it. He has no key to the lock, and he has to lock the cage, call the supervisor. The supervisor then has to come out with his key, unlock it, and verify that there was not you know, a whole bunch of car batteries in it or whatever was in it. So that, that's one of the main reasons why they only want you using that can. You know, the other cans won't work you know, for, the, for their lifters. So um, I found that to be uh, uh, real useful information. And um, then we did a tour of the, um, uh, the facility. And if you could show that, um, there's a couple of pictures I want to freeze frame on. There, right there. Okay, what you're looking at right there is mountains and mountains of recycled, non-recyclable, recycled material. This was from, not just from some Southwest ranches, this is from all over. This was stuff that people put in the recycling containers that was contaminated and could not be recycled, and they had to dump them. So, and there's several more if you want to, if you can spin through there. But you see that's a person standing there. You'll see this in the yellow. And you, this is where the, one of their sorting areas right there. And what's the next one? Uh, um, yeah, uh, you got another one. Yeah, there. And there's another one that showed cardboard. Yeah, you see the size of it. It's just mountains and mountains. All that goes to the landfill. They were sitting there with six yarders loading up trucks, and, and that's all supposed to be recycling for, uh, from all over the county that comes in there. And then they have a, uh, a bag sorter. Uh, can you flip to that? Yeah, right here. That sorts the bags, the Publix types bags, plastic bags out of the recycling. You can't recycle those kind of bags. If you're going to recycle them, take them to Publix. They have a special place for them, or the water. Any like what Bob's Any holding of these up. Any plastics. Yeah. Are not recyclable bags. They, right. I, I Containers. Kind of got you some props here, Gary. Mm -hmm. These are perfect. Yeah. Anything with a neck on it is perfect. Anything right. Anything that's a bag, toys. You might think it's recyclable intuitively, but hmm. it's not. There's it, only number one and number two are recyclable at this point. And they were they were mentioning machines. Yeah, they were mentioning it. Thank you, Bob, for that that demo. Um, they were mentioning that the uh, machines that r separate all of this um, that's contaminated cardboard. By the way, those are all pizza boxes that were contaminated. They could that go, that are going to the dump. Um, that they the machine has to be stopped like three or four times a day to be cleaned out so that it can keep re, they keep resorting. No, not that one, but the one that goes right before it. Um, it had all the rollers on it. That one right there. That's all bags that get cleaned out of it. So we're, 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 what I'm trying to emphasize to everybody who's watching is if you think putting, your, putting these, anything other than stuff like this and laundry detergent uh, boxes and cardboard, clean cardboard in. If you think you're putting in everything else, like uh, luggage suitcases were in there, uh, garden hoses, uh, kids' toys, um, you're thinking that's being recycling, you're kidding yourself, you just contaminated a whole load. And they have to dump, usually dump the whole load, you know. So it, it, it was, it was uh, really interesting to see what they go through to try to, you know, clean it up. And we have sing, single stream recycling. And if we can't get that right, where we, it's so convenient for us to just throw everything in one and make it work. We're eventually going to end up going to multi-stream, which is going to be multiple containers where you separate the glass, you separate the aluminum, you separate the, the plastics. And, you know, it's going to be a lot more work on the resident side. And I, and I mean that not as a, an aid to the company, but as an aid to the environment. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm talking more environmental issue here than than uh, money or dollars or something like that because we're kidding ourselves if that you see you see that much garbage that has to be trucked back out right that Wait. people are thinking oh I'm you know be doing a great thing I'm recycling this bag you know and it's the exact opposite of what's occurring you know and uh, mayor I know you went on the next day on that so you may have some comments and I I'll close I'll close with that okay I just want to add one more thing onto that yeah I, great job Gary I think and I did have the opportunity to go on the ride along and go to the Murph as well 
great education. Um, the one thing that I, I wanted to draw out, Gary covered, you know, did a great job on it. But the one thing I did want to add to it is, you know, as we went through this process of trying to choose a new vendor and such, there was a lot of discussion. I, and, and, I was, and I was part of it because I, you know, I had read the articles and things to indicate that really we were kidding ourselves as far as whether recycling was actually happening or not. Well, recycling is happening. So I would really encourage everybody to get back involved, uh, know that if you put something, if you take it seriously, as, as Bob and Gary are talking about there, and make the right choice of what to put in there, it will be recycled, and, um, and that's important. So, so it is happening. One other thing. I did ask, this was my first question, and it was uh, a bunch of people told me to ask me that. You can recycle the caps. <laughs> right. You can put on the caps on, leave them on the bottles, and throw it in the recycling. Oh. Um, they, the, the, the hurdles that they had at the very beginning 10 years ago, they've figured out a way around it and you can recycle the caps, so put that in with the recycling. You know, it's funny, I asked that very question when I was there yeah. and, I, and I said, can you recycle? And he said, oh yeah, you can recycle. And I said, I thought I heard that you couldn't. He said, well, he said originally it was actually a hazard that it they would run over them. They would run over them, and the top would shoot off, and it, people were getting hurt. It was like a bullet, you know. It was like a plastic bullet, and so um, so that was it. But they figured it out, and so you can you can recycle the whole thing. Great. I'll go next. If Thank you. All right. Good evening, folks. So, Gary, just a quick question: Are you going to write an article on this, or or? No, I'm going to let you do that. Okay. <laughs> you write much. Better I didn't want to get into it and find out. No, oh. no. You you write much better than I. All right. Well, thank you. That that's a compliment. Um, in, in relation to bulk uh, and, and trash pickup and recycling, I was fascinated. I mean, you know, I put it in the, the pail and there's magic <laughs> once, once they come and pick it up. But I had to go home and eat humble pie. My wife has been a recycling fanatic. She brought my kids up that way. They, nothing goes into the garbage. We, the, the new bin, we could probably put it out once a month because our recycling, it's half full every, every week, so they're, they're really conscientious. But the reason I had to eat humble pie, and this is important for everybody to know, when I cook, when I cook, I'll open up a can of whatever, tomato sauce, what, whatever it is in the can, beans, whatever. I'll dump it in the pan, and I'll toss it to the recycling. Now, that pile that Gary showed you of garbage, came in through the recycling. They bring in, what did they say, 118 tons a day yes. of recycling, and they, they actually only end up with 24 tons, I believe. Yeah, it's a real small number. Yeah, it relatively, you know, it's one in four, basically, one in, one in four and a half. And the reason is, people like me, um, when you throw in that Campbell soup can that's still got, you know, some soup in it, that creates contamination. What they were explaining to us is when they send out the metal cans, once they've crushed them all up and processed them, or they send out the soda cans or the plastic bottles, the quality of the recyclable is what they're paid on. And they're looking for 98% quality on this. In other words, no garbage in there. So when I'm throwing out Campbell soup cans in the past, I'm actually creating contamination, and that goes out to the landfill, even though I think I'm doing the right thing. So, you know, I had to change my practices. When I was cooking the other night, it's like, ah, oh, another task, got to wash them all out. But uh, it was very interesting, and uh, I'll include a lot more detail in my upcoming article for the, for the next newsletter. Um, one of the other important things to, to keep in mind, and, and Gary touched upon it uh, as far as putting the pails together, think overhead, too. You know, if you've been putting out your garbage pails in the same spot for years, and there's a tree over it. Again, the truck is about 13 feet high, and then the claw, the, the arm, is another couple of feet above that. So if you're putting it underneath some trees or directly under the power wires, they're not going to be able to pick it up. So they may have to send a supervisor back, but you know, you'll make their job go much more quickly. Your garbage will get picked up earlier if there's a, you know, we follow some of these rules. So that, that's what I have on recycling. Oh, one other thing that uh, they offered. It, it's an interesting facility, um, and uh, what uh, what we asked at the time is if anybody wants to go see it, it's you know they can set up uh, uh, I believe it's Monday through Friday type uh, resident tours of the facility where they show you how they pro garbage in, 
recycling out. They show you the whole process from end to end. And some of it's kind of fascinating. Uh, since they can't pick up aluminum with uh, magnets, doesn't work that way. They have some sort of magnetic device that makes them flip up and then they're pushed by air into the next recycling phase. So, you know, for a geek like me, there was a lot of interesting stuff there. So, what's that? Thank you, Newell. I figured you'd know it too. That's exactly what it is. Yep, yep. All right, so uh, that's all I have on the bulk, and we'll see what we can do about setting up a tour if there's anybody who's interested. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the Green Meadows meeting on Monday night. Uh, you know, as, as, Green, as Green Meadows is learning a, 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 an open secret, the council attends all of the HOA meetings across town. We, we go to the mall because there's no better way for us to understand the issues around town, to stay in touch with our community's values, and, and to get feedback. And uh, Monday night was a feedback meeting to the council on the group's displeasure on how long the, uh, the drainage project's uh, taking over there. You know, they, they talked about equipment that's been parked for months. They talk about backhoe buckets that have been sitting in places for months. And, you know, in the past, we were willing to accept their, the contractor's excuses on COVID and fuel price. I mean, there's, there's always a good reason in their mind. But for the residents, last year, I remember, they put Christmas tree lights on a backhoe to kind of bring it to our attention in a fun way. Uh, it had already been there for four or five months. So coming out of that meeting, I realized that the council needs to do something about this other than just trying to push the contractor to get the work done because we have challenges on all of these projects. So I have had a discussion with Andy and then this evening with Rod. Uh, Steve, you work with project managers all the time. Uh, I've been a professional, pro I'm a certified uh, professional project manager, been forever. And, you know, so I put my project manager hat on to look at what's going on here and how we can uh, improve execution on some of these public works projects. And, you know, the, the, the value of bringing a project manager on board to oversee the projects are, they're generally involved from the planning phase right through ribbon cutting when it comes to construction projects like we do. They would be the eyes and the ears for Rod and the Public Works team visiting our projects. We're about to start up three more in Green Meadows, and you know we're we're doing a lot. And you know Rod can old, Rod is a department head. Rod is the town's chief engineer. He's short an engineer right now, and I don't know how he sleeps at night with all of these responsibilities. So, you know, the thinking is that uh, as we move forward, we factor in the cost of a, a project manager through one of the CAI firms we do business with or one of the uh, engineering firms we do business with and factor in PM time into all of these projects so that the project manager monitors the budget, monitors the schedule, monitors every piece of work that the contractor is supposed to be delivering on as well as Play liaison, because I know we get lots of public concerns in every one of these projects. You know, Ronda, Rod doesn't have to be picking up the phone on every one of these. Susan doesn't have to. Be, if there's a person on site and we've got a complaint, this might be an opportunity for somebody to, to treat the stakeholder, you know, uh, differently than just calling town hall and complaining. So there's a number of opportunities here. We just started the discussions this week on it. You know, from a professional perspective, this is a good solution to try to uh, deliver our projects with a lot more customer satisfaction, not to mention keep an eye on the, the contractors that are not conforming with the contract, et cetera. So um, I think they'll probably be bringing back something to us, uh, you know, in the near future because we have so many projects starting up. Now, I know that the costs have not been factored into the, uh, the projects that we've already gotten funding on, but I still think it makes sense for the town to fund this type of a role to assure that our execution quality is much higher and our customer satisfaction. Because they made it pretty clear, they're not happy with this. And we're about to do you know three more projects in the same neighborhood. If we don't change our practices, we will have similar results. So. You know, when they bring, when the, the administration and Rod bring this through, I would appreciate, you know, you guys asking the right questions, but supporting kind of a change on, on how we deliver projects.
Bob, if I could jump in there for just a second. Um, Please that, do. That's just something I wanted to mention. I forgot in my trash talk. Mm -hmm. um, our, the company that we used to, just for, this is for the record, the company that we used to use, uh, Waste Pro, uh, you know, they'd add very spotty service, I'm, and I'm being nice by saying it that way, spotty service for the last six months to a year. Um, we are in the process of assessing uh, financial penalties Excellent. With, with them. So I just want to get that on the record. I don't have an amount right now. I can't, you know, specify to that. But we are in that in that mode. So, so the general public knows that we, uh, you know, we're holding them accountable. Right. Andy and I have had a number of conversations about that over the years because I was I've been upset that they get away with the quality of service. And Andy has a uh, fine line to tread as the administrator, if we start hitting them with liquidated damages early on, I mean, they can walk as well for cause. I mean, of course, we have legal methods to do it, but I'm very happy to hear that we're going to yeah. try to recover for some of their lack of quality of service. Yeah. So I just wanted to get that on the record. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, forgot, Gary. I forgot that earlier. So uh, George had brought up um, discussion at the last drainage committee meeting on uh, on uh, addressing some potential changes on our our uh, um, permitting for drainage permits. And it, it's really funny, you guys have all gone through it. When you're campaigning and you're sending out your cell phone number and your email address, you get a lot of responses. I've gotten probably more in the last two months than I got in the last four years, which is good. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. But I was, uh, I was having conversations with uh, Augie uh, Damaris, I believe. I, I, the last name is escaping me. He lives out, he's Debbie's neighbor actually. He's on uh, 199th at uh, 4900. And this guy uh, had two loads of fill delivered on a Saturday and code enforcement found him out. And you know, he got cited and uh, his resolution was to clean up the fill and re haul it off. Cost him a thousand bucks to, to haul off the fill. Now, seems like a lot of money and it, it's a pretty heavy penalty for two loads of fill. We can talk about that another time. But he is John Q neighbor in our town and he has all kinds of problems with the permit. And Gary, I know last year you guys worked on a document to streamline it. I don't know whether we need to better communicate it, but this is a smart guy. He's had a lot of challenges. He's finally, he's been working with Susan and uh, Andy on all this. I invited him to the drainage committee meetings when we start talking about the permitting process. Because being a recent resident who tried to go through the process and do things properly and felt like he was smashing, he said to me, I feel like I'm getting the runaround every time they tell me a new thing that I have to do and I, I feel for him. So, you know, I think when we address this, there's, there's probably more to go on streamlining the process. He doesn't understand why he's got to get a wetlands determination. He's been there since I think he said 69. He bought his house the same time as Newell did. Was 75 was it? Okay. So, you know, here's a guy who shows up at town hall once every 20, 30 years, and this is his experience. So, you know, we as the council need to figure out a way to make this more resident friendly. Um, we also heard some interesting stuff last night at the Sunshine Ranchers meeting. I thought that Mary Ann Allen's idea of a, a, a tiered for a level three, I mean, 30 loads of fill is not gonna have the same impact as 500 or 700 or whatever the requirements are. So maybe we have a tiered structure so that we can recover some of the impact to the community with that many trucks running through. All right, that's it on drainage. One last thing, where's the detective Hobalis? Did he run out? Oh, there he is. There he is. Yes, thank you. Come on up to the microphone. So I think uh, um, Detective Hobalis deserves recognition tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't think I'm going to get him to get any tears like last night. Nah. But he was recognized last night by Sunshine Ranches for 40 years in law enforcement, 40 years of professional service as, as a police officer. So I want to yeah, recognize him for that. And you've only been with two agencies? Two. Two yeah. agencies. I've, in 40 years, I think I've had 10 different jobs. Yes. <laughs> two. And one of the, the tidbits was, and this just tells you why he's got short hair and uh, uh, some wrinkles here and there, 
The chief of um, Hialeah was here last night uh, to recognize Jeff on his, his service, and he had trained the chief of Hialeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, everybody knows you're a character. Nobody yeah. knows the backstory, and I just want to thank you for your service yeah. to the town. Well, it's a pleasure working here, and I thank you. All right. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank All right. you. Mayor, that's all I have. Great, great. David, do you have uh, some comments for this evening? Oh, yes, I do. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, um, let me begin. Uh, congratulations. Uh, Mayor Lee, Mayor Lee, Mayor Lee, and the let me begin. Um, as everybody knows, Monday was the beginning of early voting. Um, and, you know, Bob made a, a real interesting comment when he was speaking, talking about attending meetings where you, the HOA meetings, where you learn the values of what's going on in the individual um, neighborhoods and getting feedback from the residents. Uh, and, you know, this is why I was, uh, if not the first, among the first to endorse Bob for a re-election. I know I was the first contributor to his campaign. Um, but I think it's imperative that if you want to learn about what Southwest Ranches is about, you have to attend every single meeting. And I have seen Bob at every single meeting that I've been and in some of them that I've missed. I just want to say that um, with early voting going on, that I have given Bob my endorsement. Moving on. All right. Um, as Bob had mentioned earlier, we had a meeting last night with Sunshine Ranches, and then there was discussion about um, uh, the permitting. And I, I just want to get a feeler out there if uh, other members of the council would be um, – interested or, or, or support a, a direction to the comp plan advisory board to review this and come up with a, an ordinance or some kind of legislation that could address the level three drainage um, and above whether it's a tiered issue or something like that um, is there can i get at least three council members that would uh, support uh, sending this over there I know there were some issues uh, procedurally, but I think this is a substantive issue that Sunshine Ranch has had a big concern about, and I just want to float this out there to see where uh, the council is at on this. Uh, David, I'll, I'll jump in there just for a second, and I've, I've spoken to a number of residents about this idea as well. Uh, you know, the, the drainage committee is the committee where I believe that discussion belongs, initially at least. And I think out of respect to that committee, I know they've already started that discussion. I think that they have uh, more to discuss. I know I've got some comments on that when I get to my comments as well. Um, I believe they should discuss it first and see uh, what they come up with and what their recommendations are. I believe if, um, if, uh, if that's, you know, if it needs more work and the, and the comp plan can help out, I, I believe that that makes sense at that point. But I think to take it out of the, the board's hand where it's, it's their primary responsibility and put it in a different board's hand, I'm not sure that's, that's the right way to do it. I'm also open to um, those two boards having a joint meeting so that the comp plan can, can express to the, the drainage you know, their concerns. I think, that, I think that would be a good idea as well. But I think initially, ultimately, it should stay in the hands of the drainage committee and allow them to do their work. Yeah, if I'll, I'll, I'll to the say that again, David. He's deferring to uh, Steve's position on that, so he agrees. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, the, um, we have a unique situation up here on the dais right now. There's three chairmen of the <laughs> drainage board sitting here. One, two, three, and and number four is out in the audience. Right. Doug McKay. <laughs> so uh, we we kind of know what. The purview is behind all the, especially the drainage uh, board, and I really think that they're they're the ones that should be dealing with this on an ongoing basis. Out of courtesy, uh, if you want to have a, a, a dual meeting.
for one to explain to the other, but it's really within the purview of the of the drainage board, I, and they and they work on it the most, uh, you know. So I kind of think it should stay there. I, I absolutely support that. I think though, putting it in front of the comp plan board at the end, once they've come up with the recommendations, as as you had said, Steve, makes a lot of sense because. Yeah. You know, the the drainage committee is certainly focused on drainage, and the uh, comp plan board has a legal mind for these types of things and how things fit into our ordinances. So I think, you know, a joint session or two to come up with the final recommendation to us makes complete sense. Okay, David, so, David back um, is, is that something we, we can agree on, or, um, Jim? Yes, he's saying yes. His mic's not on, but he is saying yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes, it'll go to the drainage board, yes. Great, thank uh, you. So, so drainage and then I guess a, a joint meeting um, to discuss it. Is that what I'm, I'm reading here? Yes. All right. <clears throat> uh, all right, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm going to leave the issue about the November 17th uh, meeting with uh, um, the fireworks for uh, Steve. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I want to commend Andy um, and uh, Gary had brought this up as well for uh, moving forward with the um, uh, penalty on waste pro. Um, and I'd like to ask Andy to um, uh, elaborate on that when it's uh, his turn to uh, uh, comment. Um, it's very important that our residents do know that we are um, protecting their, um, their payments. And then um, last, um, as earlier brought up by uh, Chief Kinsey, the uh, LPRs, they're a big, big, big concern. Um, you know, not only did we have the mail theft uh, just a, a, a few days ago in Sunshine Ranches, but we've also had auto theft. And I'm not saying that the LPRs are the end all. The, the, the one item that is going to end all of this is not going to happen that way. But it does give us a tool, an additional tool for law enforcement to go after these bad folks that are infiltrating our neighborhoods and, and taking our property. Um, and if we can get uh, a way to confirm an identity of somebody, it's just one additional tool um, in the toolbox. Um, I think this is a strong law enforcement uh, tool, and it's something I very much support. Um, and I just want to make sure, um, I think Russell was going to give me a little um, explanation of where we are with the LPRs. I'd like to ask that um, and when I'm finished. And then a um, <clears throat> little uh, aspect about the recycling um, Way back when I uh, first moved in 97 to uh, Sunshine Ranches, I learned that uh, Norman Lazier, who was uh, Joan Glickman's um, husband, was, um, was one of the initiators of the recycling for our neighborhood. So um, uh, kudos to Norman, and may he rest in peace. And um, we're, we're still fighting for our recycling, but it, it, he really did a, a good job of getting this initiated. Uh, and uh, Steve, that kind of wraps up my comments, uh, except for what I've asked for Russell and for uh, Andy. Thank you so much for allowing me to appear telephonically. Thanks. Great. Thank you for joining us, Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah, Jim. <laughs> Steve, I don't know how you go last. There's nothing left to talk There's about. There's not much. I had a long list. It's, <laughs> right. it's dwindling down to nothing. Uh, I, right. I will say that uh, I did make plans to go on the garbage truck. But the caretaker at the house said if I did, the other knee would be broken. So I passed on that. But I will schedule that in the future. You know, I grew up around the heavy equipment and spent all my life with heavy equipment. So I'd love to see that. That'd be great. Uh, I'd like to ask the residents here, how many people saw the sign out front when you come in telling you how fast you're going? Nobody saw the sign out front telling you how fast you were going? I said, please did, because they, they put it there, I'm sure. We have two new trailers in town. And they're going to move them around from one street to the next. And it will tell you how fast you're going. If the speed limit is 25 and they set it at that, if you're going 35, it'll flash. If you're going at what speed? <laughs> 
Oh, we, we can set that if you're X amount over the speed limit. Oh, okay. It's got the red and blue flashing lights, but we can, we can determine All right. what we'll set that for. All right, so if the speed limit is 25, they're going to set the red flashing lights at 26 to tell you to slow down. You know, But I think that that trailer will be very effective because when you see it in a residential area, you're not paying attention, you're in a hurry, you're something, you see this, and you'll, I, I think you'll tap the brake. So I think these two trailers will be a great help to us. And I thank the Safety and Traffic uh, Committee that recommended them, and I thank the council for purchasing them. Thank you. Um, I will touch bases uh, with the uh, farmer's market. I was able to go uh, last weekend, and it's the first time that I've been able to get out and go, and it is a wonderful event. Thank you, Mayor. It's, it grows and gets better every day. Uh, we have a private street. I'll, I'll touch bases real quick. We have a private street down the uh, down at the end of 60, uh, 166. They've been working for three years. I've been trying to help them as much as possible. But they are going to finally repave that road. You know, we have a number of miles of private roads here in the town. And they are actually working on, through Rod's help and through uh, Andy and through Weekly, they're going to get that road paved, and then they're going to turn it over to the town. Uh, you know that if you live on a private street and something happens, uh, you, the homeowners on that street, are liable. And I don't think they realize that. But now, with this new paving that's going on, and uh, they turn in the street back over to the town, then their liability to be gone. You heard Bob mention the Homeowners Association meeting. There were some upset residents, and they've been upset for quite a while. I've been over talking to many of them, along with Rod, along with Russell, in person. And they just had some questions as to when things were going to end, when was this going to stop, uh, how, what could they do to fix their yards. So I reached out and I called our town attorney, Mr. Polyakov, and I asked him if he could give me some kind of an idea as to what we can do to the contractor or what we can't do to the contractor. So, uh, Keith, if you got that handy, I'd... I'd you know, if you sure. have that available, I'd, I'd like to sure. ask you to speak, uh, if you would. Sure, Councilman. As a result of uh, your uh, constant advisement uh, that there was a problem out there, uh, both Rod and Andy uh, directed legal to immediately uh, essentially put the contractor on notice that we would be calling his bond. There's a procedure we have to follow. Uh, we immediately sent him that notification uh, based on uh, your desire and the town's desire to let him know that if he doesn't finish, the bond will be called. Um, there's a 14-day waiting period after we sent that letter, uh, be but because we sent it two weeks ago, uh, <laughs> that waiting period is now over. The next step is um, we advise the uh, bonding company, which we have, that uh, he has not responded to our 14-day notice. Uh, the bonding company now has 10 days to meet with us in good faith in order to see if they can resolve the issue. If not, they have to immediately find a contractor that the town will be agreeable to to take over the project and complete it at the bonding company's expense. So everything is fully under uh, the process right now. We've already shaved off that 14-day period, so you're probably looking about 30 days for that new contractor now to get started, but um, we're in the middle of that process right now, and it's moving forward. Some of the questions that were asked, will, will the driveways be fixed? Will the yards be repaired? Will all of that be put back like it was before? Uh, and I've been telling them that that's what I've heard, that it will be put back the way it was the driveways will be fixed if they were concrete, if they were asphalt, they'll be repaved. Is that still, if a new contractor comes in, will they do that? They will be required to at the bonding company's expense. It will probably be even better than it was supposed to be done previously. I am sure that when we have that meeting with the bonding company, that uh, Rod and Andy will be on that call as well uh, with their list of everything that you just brought up, and, and I know a lot more that needs to be done to uh, finish out the project. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Andy and Rod, both, like I said, and Russell. I know you were out there many a time, and I really appreciate it. But it is uh, a problem. The street is tore up pretty bad. The yards are tore up. And, you know, the equipment sits there. Like you said, Bob mentioned that piece of equipment last year that was decorated with Christmas lights because it sat there for so long. Uh, but they just wanted to know when it's going to end, you know. Now, I know we have a process in place in the future 
that when these projects start, we'll be able to notify the residents well ahead of time as to what to expect because there is another, and I hate to, t I hate to tell them this, but there is another project coming. And uh, you know, it will finish up Green Meadows headed to the south, but those residents to the north will be happy, but the residents to the south of where it's starting won't be happy. So, you know, it's just one of those things that, that are coming. But I think when the, when the projects are done, I think they'll be happy with it. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate the updates. All right. Um, yeah, I did have an extensive list. Um, <laughs> I don't any longer, so that's a good thing. Um, so I'll just fill in some gaps here. Um, I did want to mention as far as uh, the waste management, I think all is going well. Uh, one thing that we touched on a little bit was the map. Um, uh, the map is, I don't think is, uh, can, has room for improvement and I've asked Andy to work on that and he's going to get a lot more precise with it. There's a lot of questions. I'll be honest with you, I, I looked at the map and I had no idea what, what day my pickup was. I had no idea, so I had to go to the experts, and they had to tell me. So if I can't, if the mayor can't figure it out, then it probably needs a little bit of work, or you need a new mayor. I don't know which one of the two, but at any rate, um, all right, uh, yeah. So uh, you, back on the fourth of July, um, we had, as we always have during these holidays, we have um, you know a real a real issue in town with the fireworks and the animals. And so after the 4th of July, we committed to putting together a workshop where we would bring in experts on, on what we can do to help protect our animals during this time with the fireworks. And, um, and so we've been working on that. I appreciate David's help on this. He was able to, to uh, uh, have a, a vet that he's worked with in the past that is committed to doing this and we've decided to schedule it on the November 17th meeting so our um, our next uh, town council meeting on November 17th will have this it's um, but I want to be uh, so what this is going to be is we're going to have have the, the veterinarian kind of explain to us you know from her point of view the things that she's aware of that can help improve this but I'm going to open it up to the public as well because I know there's a lot of knowledge in our town, people that have been dealing with this for many years that have things and have other ways that they've, they've, they've been able to successfully work through this. So I'm just looking for that exchange of ideas between residents and from experts um, and so that as we go into uh, the New Year's uh, fireworks kind of uh, season, that hopefully we'll be able to have a little bit more, um, um, you know, be able to handle our animals a little better and make it a little less stressful on them. That's the goal. So that's the next meeting. I encourage anyone with animals, especially large animals, but it, it can be any animals. We all know it, there's, you know, the fireworks affect all animals. So um, to come out to the next meeting so that we can not only hear what's going on, but we can have that exchange of knowledge between the residents. Um, Oh, one other thing on the uh, um, the waste management I wanted to touch on is that please make sure that you're only using the waste management containers. Um, Gary touched on it, but um, the other containers they 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 will not pick them up, um, so it, it'll be left there. If they you know, and the ride along it was explained to me that basically those containers will get crushed. They'll either get crushed by the, the equipment that picks it up, or as Gary mentioned, uh, they'll, they'll fall into the, the, the back of the truck, and that's even a bigger issue. So, so please make sure you use the waste management containers. And if you think of it, um, move the handles towards the house. It'll work either way, but you'll be happier on a rainy day if you move the handles towards the house. <laughs> a, lot a lot happier, right. Um, all right. Um, Officer Detective Habalas, thank you again. No, you can sit down. I'm not going to make you get up again, but, but I do appreciate it. I did want to say a word, and I also wanted to say, uh, almost as important, almost, not quite, almost as important, we have some cupcakes in the back over there to celebrate uh, um, your 40 years. So if anybody gets a little uh, hungry out there, please, you can make your way over there and, and get a cupcake. Um, uh, since we're not going to discuss the, door, the dog ordinance when we get there, I do have one comment about that. Uh, we've covered some of it. Debbie covered 
most of it. Um, one other thing I wanted to make sure that when we do this is covered is that if somebody, you know, a lot of us have the dogs for protection, okay? If somebody comes onto our property and comes into our house and gets attacked by our dog, that is not a vicious dog. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's 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 a you know a properly trained dog, and so I want to make sure that that's that's properly covered in the ordinance as well. Um, all right, and then the last thing is just a few thoughts on the the the, the drainage, uh, that really the fill ordinance. Um, a few things that I know a lot of it has already been covered, and um, but I just want to reinforce some of it and a couple couple of new things. Um, one is. As we go through this, I think, you know, I've heard a lot of feedback from a lot of residents, which is awesome. Um, I think some of the things that we need to be looking at is to ensure that the permit sign, that big yellow sign, is on the street where everybody can see it, regardless of, of you know, the, the limited access or the limited frontage on the road that there is, it needs to be on the street. Um, mailing out a letter to the residents that are adjacent to it and that will you know see this going on and and have their drainage drain or their, their yeah their drainage affected in one way or another those folks they should get a letter for notification so they understand basically the communication we need to find ways to improve our our communication um, we need to talk about and this is something I'm really looking for feedback from the drainage committee but I'll bring it up here there is a requirement today that um, the engineer go out to the site on, I, I don't know if it's level two, but definitely on level three, to, to view the site and, and do an on-site. Um, I think that's good, but what I'm hearing, and I want, I'm just, I'm not making a statement here, I'm just making, you know, saying it needs to be looked into, is that perhaps the topo is even a better tool than going out there because it gives you the actual elevations. It's it's an engineer's view with all of the all of the elevations on it. So um, if if that visit on site visit makes sense, if it's useful, then I want to keep it. But if it's if it's just a step, another way that you know to slow down the process and and have bureaucracy get in the way, then I think we should look at eliminating it. But we need to find out. You know, I want to understand through the discussion of the drainage committee. Um, you know, what's the usefulness or not of that visit? Um, and then the last thing, and we touched a little bit on this one, is I think we need to take a look at uh, the number of levels. Um, as I think, Gary, or maybe Bob, Gary, one of us was talking about, you know, we've, we've all done our, our time as, as on the uh, chairman of the drainage committee, and I know as we've done that, we went through all the different levels and we set those up um, and I think generally they've worked well, but it's been a long time since we've looked at them. And I think that, you know, there may be a need to insert one or two more levels in there and um, with different types of, of uh, requirements to go along with those levels. So there's some work, definitely work to be done there. I look forward to the drainage committee taking a look at that, um, getting feedback and input from the, from the comp board, and um, looking forward to improving that. And, uh, and making, you know, making that whole process better. All right, so we've got, um, I know, some homework here, not really homework, but some follow-up items for uh, Russell and Andy, and so when we go to the administrative comments, if we can follow up on that, that would be fantastic. All right, legal comments. Sure, Mayor. Uh, just to touch on a couple of things that were raised during your comments. Um, first off, obviously, congratulations to Detective Habalas and 40 year of service is uh, incredibly impressive, a true asset to our community. So congratulations on that. Um, Council Member Hartman brought something up about the wetland determination. I just want to tell everyone in the case they, they don't know in the public, I know the council member knows, is wetland determinations dictated by the state of Florida, then runs to Broward County. Uh, Andy, myself, I think Rod, maybe Russell were at a meeting in which we pled with them to uh, let us out of that requirement. And uh, the answer was absolutely no way, no shape, no how, um, that they will continue to require uh, a wetland determination for um, fill 
um, within the town of Southwest Ranches as they are in every jurisdiction in Broward County because they're required to by the state of Florida and they cannot violate that. So that is why a wetland determination is required. It's not the town, it's uh, the county through the state that makes that uh, requirement. Um, when discussing Phil, a couple things from the legal side that I want to throw out that maybe the board can consider and I, I guess, you know, chairmen and, and board members out there. Um, one of the issues is uh, the mayor mentioned topographical surveys. At the last meeting that came up and surveys came up, so I actually texted some engineers, just asked them roughly the question about uh, surveys and topographicals. Uh, one thing that we need to add in our code is um, expiration date potentially of a survey. Uh, engineers believe that you know they should expire at a certain period of time just to relook at it, relook at the structures, relook at the property. Most cities have a, um, a one year requirement uh, for full construction. You may want to change that, but it's up to you just something to consider whether or not you want to say surveys need to be within so many years of the work. As it relates to topographical surveys, and I know engineers love them, but what the engineers that I spoke to on the, on, uh, the phone last week mentioned to me is the topographical survey is only good as of the day the topographical survey was done. And they said on numerous occasions, they'll get a topographical survey, then they'll go in a field visit, and they'll see that someone illegally placed 12 loads of fill on it after they got their topo in order to try to change the results of the topo. So uh, just from a legal standpoint, even if we have a topo, I would still suggest a site visit. It doesn't have to be a lengthy one, but it needs to determine, okay, this topo is generally consistent with what I see out there. And that's the reason why, because a, a topo is a photograph. It's just a snapshot on that day it was taken, and, and that's why a lot of times they combine them with the two. So I just want to mention that. In regards to other two other quick fill issues, um, we've always had a policy, uh, Vice Mayor has uh, been insisted on it and others, that um, over a certain level of fill, once it gets to the legal process and code enforcement, that that fill must be removed from the property in order to ensure in compliance. I would ask the board to uh, consider what that level would be, whether it's two, three, four, whatever new levels they install, so that that language be put directly into the code saying that as a remedy, uh, the, the, the mandatory remedy is removal of the fill if someone's caught. Similarly, I would put in there an actual fine scenario of, of what, you know, uh, the town council believes the fine should be for violation of fill. Uh, you know, I always say, oh, it's the maximum uh, law, which could be up to $5,000, 10,000 on repeats, et cetera, which is, is a huge amount. So if, if the board and then the council comes to us and say, listen, a violation of level two should be $500, a violation of level three, you know, at least there can be some guidance in the ordinance of what we should be seeking so that also contractors and homeowners who violate the law uh, will know what they potentially could uh, expect as a result of the violation. So I just wanted to throw those out there for consideration when uh, you all are debating that, uh, that ordinance. Um, as for the vicious uh, dogs, I, I copied exactly uh, what the, the mayor wanted. I know uh, Councilmember Kaczynski is working on comments as well. Debbie Green, you went really quickly. If you could just email me tomorrow uh, your comments as well, and then I'll try to combine them all, send them to the council, and see if there's any final comments before that comes uh, back to us for consideration. That's it, Mayor. I just wanted to address those issues. Great. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Keith, yeah. uh, you mentioned the topo is good for, it's a snapshot of that particular day. Why would somebody go in and change that by bringing in fill? If it says that the level is at five foot, why would they go in and change a document like that and bring fill in? What would be the purpose sure. of that? Sure, so if someone has a, uh, a ridiculously low level lot, okay, or, or, or otherwise, they will get a elevation reading, um, probably a higher lot is actually I'm doing reverse, they'll get an elevation reading and then they'll come to Rod and they'll say, I'm only putting five loads of fill on the property or, or whatever it is. And then they'll bring out 50 loads. And then when they get their new elevation, it will be the proper elevation. I know I'm messing up the direction where it goes, but that's what happens. They, 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 
you know, it, it's done on purpose at whatever level it is. I think it's the lower level uh, so that they can basically do more than legally they may be permitted to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to hear what the, what the drainage board has to say about that. To me, if you have a topo at a particular point in time, right, I mean, that's the way it was. Like you said, it's a snapshot. We know for sure that's the way it was. We have, you know, it's, it's an engineer went out there and did it. Um, and what we're interested in is at that point in time versus when you get the sign off. You know, that's, that's the difference. That's, and if they mess with it in between, that's their problem. You know, I don't, I don't see how that really affects things. We're interested how it was at the point in time. And we do actually. One before, right. one before, before and after. after. Exactly. So, and I, I think and that's, after. yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. Not only do we have a. Uh, hey, George. Would you like to speak? How you doing, George Morris, chair of, the, chair, chair of the drainage board? Yes, dying to speak because I'm an expert on this issue. Not that I really want it to be, but I am. Nonetheless, uh, we provide, a topo is provided ahead of time and a topo is provided after the work is done. Mm -hmm. On top of which, what a lot of people might not know, there's a thing called LIDAR. Rod actually has access to that. And particularly in some case in Sunshine Ranch, as I heard about in that particular case, Rod did review the LIDAR are the current conditions and, and compared it to the topo. So there is backup of LIDAR. We'll tell you, you can click on different colors and know different elevations and you can see whether somebody cheated on the, on the, the survey or the prop is actually higher than the neighbors. But this was something that was actually done with that particular instance in Sunshine Ranches where Rod uh, looked at the LIDAR, clicked on the elevation, saw the surrounding properties and actually did show it was, it was low. So there is LIDAR. We need to take that into consideration as well. That's all. Great. By, by the way, Thank George, I, I'm not discounting topos. I, I clearly think they're important, but I also think a site visit is important as well. Yeah. That was the only point. I we, there's many steps. You know, yeah. uh, Some instances may require a site visit by the engineer. Yeah. Depends upon whether you, we got a 25-foot grid, 50-foot grid, or someone got a topo with you know, something 100 foot, 300 foot, 10, 10 points versus a grid. If, if the topo's on a grid, then it I, in my opinion, wouldn't think it would require a site visit. But if a topo was given and there's a few points, maybe they're hiding something and then a site visit would be warranted. So right. maybe at the at discretion of the engineer, I don't know. It's yeah. something that the drainage... Something that they, they need to talk about. It's, yeah, there's, right. there's room for discussion. Thank you. Right, right. And definitely at the end, I think, yeah. you know, you have to have the yeah. site visit at the end, right? That's, that's, yeah. that's required. That's the inspection. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Just a quick comment on LIDAR. That's just the latest technology. It's shot with a drone, and it's using laser instead of a survey or with a stick uh, to go out and map the area. So it is. It really, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, there's also a time interval. Yeah. I was just talking to Keith about it. It's like once every five years that, mm. they, that they do it. They so, do it yeah, it's not yeah. an every year thing. And there is an expiration date on the, uh, on the topo as well. I believe two it's two years. Yeah. 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 Where is that? Is it in the code? Uh, I looked. I didn't see it. That's what I'm I don't know if that's in a policy or in the code. I think you might be referring to the wetland the delineation, which has a two-year That Okay. That's what it is. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks for that correction. No I, that, I, I would only suggest that you... I yeah. No. I think right. that's... I think that's... I think that... No. I, I agree 100 percent, Keith. Yeah. There Makes needs sense. to be a, a uh, an expiration date on that. That's... They don't age well. No, they don't. We, we, we have a very creative town. <laughs> so you're going to declassify the documents. <laughs> All right. Andy, I think uh, I, I've kind of lost control of the meeting, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll see if we can get this back, back in order. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things, Mayor. I know you all had expected to see continuing services contracts for uh, other professional services on this meeting. There are 10 different agreements and resos that we weren't quite uh, all the ducks weren't in a row, so to speak, so that'll be on the November 17th meeting. Just want to acknowledge that. Uh, speed trailer, Council Member Albritton spoke about. We'll be working on a rotation to move those. There are two, not just one, so we have two of them. Uh, we'll be working on a rotation to move those around town, so we'll, we'll get back to you on that. On the liquidated damages on Waste Pro, I don't recall the numbers precisely, but we did hit them for liquidated damages for both August and for September, and we were in the low five digits, if I remember correctly. So it was a, it was a, a pretty substantial penalty. 
uh, on the mapping that, that the mayor spoke about, and I know some of you have all expressed concerns on the maps for the bulk zones and collection zones. I know Russell's working with our GIS consultants. I think they have a draft to him, so we expect to have that GIS later, which will be certainly much more accurate than the color maps that you've been looking at, and those, are gonna be, those will be on our GIS uh, on the link on the town website. So we expect those. I'm going to turn it over to him to update that and the LPRs in, in just a moment. So I know he can speak to that. And uh, I, just the only thing I'll tell you all is uh, I have a family situation that I need to deal with, and I have an early flight tomorrow morning. Uh, at this point, I expect to be back in town Sunday night, but that's subject to change. But obviously, Russell, Danielle, the rest of the staff is here to certainly take care of whatever you need in my absence. So thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you, Andy. Russell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on the the mapping, uh, so we uh, met, the GIS committee and my, uh, including myself met with the GIS consultant last week, and that was certainly one of the things that we identified as a priority for them to work on. And so they've been working on it. We do have a draft uh, layer that will show the different zones for recycling solid waste and for bulk waste. Uh, there are some refinements that need to be made. I hope to have that done by tomorrow, with the hopes of having it on the website by tomorrow afternoon. If not, early next week, Monday, Tuesday, I, th I think at the latest, we should be fine. As it relates to the LPR update, um, we have nine locations uh, that have the, all of the equipment on them. We're now just waiting for FPNL to have their inspections done. So they, they give themselves a window of, you know, three days or so of business days to get that done. Once those inspections are done and they, we can power the, the, um, the units properly, then they have to be fine-tuned and calibrated and so on and so forth. So that's usually another day or so. So I suspect that by the end of next week, by next Friday of, of next week, um, we should have those nine locations fully operational. Then that, um, that leaves four locations that still um, were in the process of uh, getting the RLAs from the county and some other issues worked out with FPNL uh, to get resolved so that we can get those operational as well. Unfortunately, FPNL was... There was a little bit of an additional setback uh, from my initial estimate of having everything done by the end of the month because of Hurricane Ian. Uh, our project engineer from FPNL that was working on it was sent over to the West Coast and he was over there for 10 days. Uh, so clearly that delayed our progress on that as well. So we hope to have those all done probably by the uh, middle of, I would say, um, the middle of November. And then there's only one other privately funded location um, that um, that's going to be a little bit further out and I believe also the location on Griffin and 127th thereabouts um, that location we're waiting on the county RLA the revocable license agreement uh, to get that worked out so that's you know um, that's a county timeline but the equipment is in you know in place it's in hand uh, once we get the equipment and the approval I'm sorry once we get the approval from the county um, you know it should be a pretty quick turnaround as well so we're making progress, and like I said, you'll start to see a lot of hits coming up in the next uh, few weeks. Very good. All good. Right. Thank you. You want Appreciate to the update. Jump in with a question. Sure. So Russell and I had a couple, of, at least a, I think two conversations on this. Uh, residents had reached out when they had heard about the LPR uh, over in. Um, they were, you know, asking for kind of if their area is covered. And I had the conversation with Russell on the comprehensive coverage of the town is probably the best way to put it. And there appear that there are some gaps. The, the you know, the, the team went forward with the funding that we provided and did the best they could to cover as much of the town as they could. Now, I asked Russell to, at some point when the project's done, come back with whatever the gap cost would be. If it's four more, if it's two more, if it's one more, whatever it is. But uh, I would hope we'll probably hear that after maybe the holidays, the beginning of the year. I didn't try to pin them down, but at, at this point, let's finish the project we have and then go plug our steel curtain around the edges if, if where it's necessary. Right. So. Good. Good. All right. Um, item number nine. Do we want to table this? Well, I think we have to read yeah, it but in. If, and then if we it. could read it into the record. Do you want to read it? You want me to read it? I'll, I'll read it. I'm sorry, the book's in front of me. In ordinance of the Town of Southwest Branches, Florida, amending the Town of, of Southwest Branches Code of Ordinances to regulate runaway dogs and dangerous dogs, providing for inclusion in the Town's Code, providing for severability, 
providing for conflict and providing an effective date. Mayor, as we discussed early on, uh, Council Member uh, Kaczynski has requested this item to be tabled, uh, which would mean non no discussion tonight, which is why we had ancillary discussion. It doesn't need to be to a time and date because it's only first reading, so just a motion to table will suffice. David, you want to make a motion? Motion to table, please. Second. We have a motion to table. If you can please call the roll. Council Member Albritton? Yes. Council Member Hartman? Yes. Council Member Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Jablonski? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passed. Great, thank you. Items Aye. tabled. All right, item number 10. A resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Wrenches, Florida, accepting and approving an agreement with the State of Florida Department of Environmental Protection to receive $469,000. For the Southwest Ranches, Southwest 63rd Street and Southwest 185th Way drainage improvement, authorizing the mayor, town administrator, and town attorney to enter into an agreement and providing an effective date. Go for it, Bob. Sir? You make a motion? It's in your yeah. area? Yes. Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> okay. Any uh, council comment on this item? Seeing none, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I will say this this particular area and this particular corner is one of the worst in town. So I am thrilled to see this mm -hmm. uh, being addressed. Um, yeah, I was out there uh, two days after the hurricane. It was still flooded. Yeah. So this will go a long way to resolve one of the bowls we have in town. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Okay. If we can please call the roll. Council Member Albritton? Yes. Council Member Hartman? Yes. Council Member Kaczynski? Vice Mayor Jablonski? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. <clears throat> item number 11. Item 11, a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, approving the First Amendment to the agreement with J.A. Medina LLC, approving a budget amendment to the fiscal year 2022-23 uh, town budget, authorizing the mayor, town administrator, and town attorney to execute the amendment and providing an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any conversation on the calendar? Hey, Andy, if you maybe say a few words on this. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, th this is an amendment to the contract for code enforcement for the town. One of the challenges that we've had in code enforcement, similar to the volunteer de uh, fire department, is we come, we, we become a training ground. And, and we're not able to hang on to some people who, who have left here in, in the situation of the fire department where they've moved on to full-time departments. And we've had the same issue in code enforcement, where we're bringing people in who, who really have no code experience at all. We're doing their initial training. We're, we're, we're bringing them up to speed. We're seeing them get their level one, perhaps in some cases their level two. But what happens is the contract doesn't allow for additional compensation for those people. And, and so we wind up losing good people. This is, allows us, this doesn't put, this amendment doesn't put another nickel in Julio's pocket, not a, not a nickel. But it does allow us to hang on to some people, to reward them for continuing their level one, level two, level three, et cetera, different certifications, and, and uh, have that continuity, that longevity with the town, that knowledge of our residents. Uh, we see this as an opportunity to, to substantially upgrade uh, code, code enforcement and the performance of that department. Thank you, Mayor. Andy, one more thing to throw in there. The decision as to whether or not to allocate the additional funding is solely that of your town administrator. So you maintain the full control on how that funding is spent. So I just want to make that clear as well. Yeah, thank you. And that's a very important point if you know Southwest Ranch's history. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none. Any further council comment? Seeing none, if you please call the roll. Council Member Albritton? Yes. Council Member Hartman? Yes. Council Member Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Jablonski? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passed. Great. Item number 12, please. Item 12 is a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, urging the Broward County Animal Care and Adoption Division to reconsider the intake policy requiring municipalities and law enforcement to hold stray animals for a time period of 72 hours prior to acceptance by the county. 
providing for distribution. <laughs> I'm providing an effective date. There's a motion on the table, Mayor. Second. And a second. Great. Um, yeah, David, uh, maybe I don't know if you want to say a few words on this. I know you, we appreciate your work on this and identifying this and bring this to our attention. Yeah, uh, yeah I learned that uh, the uh, Broward County Animal Care and Adoption Division um, imposed, unilaterally imposed, a 72-hour uh, hold in the municipality uh, and law enforcement of the municipality uh, where these loose uh, dogs and loose, loose animals are, are found. And, you know, it's an undue burden on the town of Southwest Ranches and our law enforcement uh, and baby police to, to do this. We didn't plan for this in our budget negotiations. This is, this is just an, uh, a burden that's placed on the town. We don't have any facilities to hold these animals. And we're just asking them to reconsider this decision. It's a little uh, softer than what I wanted, but, you know, this is what other municipalities have adopted, and this is what I support. Great. Thank you, David, and thanks for bringing this forward. Um, any further council comment on this yeah, item? Yeah, I have a question about this. I mean, Broward County has supplied animal control services to the municipalities for my whole life living here. Um, you know, are they not budgeting the right amount of money to be able to handle, or is their shelter too small? Why are they foisting this back on the municipalities who are completely unprepared? And, you know, it's forget about the cost. How do you even implement this at the local level? So if anybody has any ideas or any insight in terms of why the county is doing this, I'd love to know. It's, uh, I, I was at the county commission meeting when it was discussed. It has to do with not only funding, but overcrowding. Um, and then the third reason that is floating around that they gave is that if a dog gets lost, that it's more likely that it will, its owner will be looking for it within a finite area of the municipality it's found in, mm -hmm. rather than going to a Broward County shelter. But the problem with what they did is no municipality has the capability of, of housing dogs at an instant uh, which is essentially what they occurred. Right. Um, and, and so uh, most municipalities are passing this ordinance to basically say to the county, you know, what do you expect us to do? We don't have weekend staff that's going to be able to take care of, uh, of a dog. But, but I, I was just mentioning uh, to Russell, and I'll just put it on the record, is we do have a wonderful paddock that's built out there. And at some point uh, we may need to consider dog-proofing it um, for the occasional situation where we may have to deal with this issue. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the last time the county upgraded the, uh, the shelter, they built a new one. It's probably 15, 20 years ago. It sounds like they need to be investing. If they're going to have a no-kill shelter, then they need to be able to support that position and not, like I said, foist it back on the municipalities. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, or, or we may have a resident in town that's willing to, you know, do this, but that would be at a cost, obviously, yeah. to the town. Oh, that's an idea if, if you we know, have uh, to do this. Right. See if somebody would be interested. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the problem with that, like, yeah, the problem with that, I, was, I thought about that reading this, is if, if we did that, is we could also suddenly become the place to drop a, a dog off. Yeah, I know, Ooh, I know. That's Absolutely. the downside. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of scares me because we, I see it all the time with strays in our town that people, you know, toss out of cars because they yep. don't want the animal anymore. You know? yep. Anna Coldice yeah. mentioned that on the Monday night meeting that she's, yeah. and she's fostering a dog right now that was cast out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yep. you know, we, we, if, we, if we build a facility, which I think is a great idea, but I think it's going to backfire on us yeah. in the long run. You know, everybody can say, oh, take the dog to Southwest Ranger. They'll take him, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to be very careful. Yeah. Have to be very yeah. careful for sure. All right. Um, yeah, uh, public discussion. You also have to remember that we've also had this discussion before one time before. <clears throat> and the flip side of this is that we have said no kennels, professional kennels within our town, and this would be a professional kennel run by the town, 
therefore opening the door to kennels all over town mm -hmm. at that point, I believe. So we can't say that only the town can run a kennel and we do it by contract with somebody else because then we'd be doing it on private property. So anyway, that's something that we've got to avoid at all costs is making ourselves the kennel capital of Broward County. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. All right, I think we're good. If you can please call the roll. Councilmember Albritton? Yes. Councilmember Hartman? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Jablonski? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passed. Very good. And item number 13 is the approval of the minutes of July 28th. Do we have any additions or corrections to the minutes from the council? Motion to approve. Second. Seeing none, any additions, corrections from the public? No, Hollingsworth, 199th Avenue again. Uh, not that uh, addition or correction, but as a time frame. We're talking about July 28th. This is now basically November that we're talking about. You got August, September, October meetings behind. Are we talking about somewhere, talking about this meeting in March of next year or something like that? Because we got the holidays coming up and everything else. So I'd like to see the minutes a little bit sooner than ancient history. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Seeing none, if we can please call the roll. Councilmember Albritton? Yes. Councilmember Hartman? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Jablonski? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion um, passed. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, <coughs> before, before we adjourn, I do have one, one other comment, um, and that is uh, our town administrator, Andy Burns, he gave me a book to read. He gave me a book to read. He gave me a homework assignment. And um, it was an exceptional book uh, to read. It's, it's a quick read. I read it in just a couple days. Um, Russell's got it. There it is, The Death of a Public Servant. Um, if, you want, if you want insight, if you want insight into, it's a true story, happened right here in Broward County. Newell, it's one I know you are extremely familiar with. Um, and if you want insight into the challenges of being a, uh, a city manager, a town administrator here in Broward County, um, I strongly encourage you to read that book. It's a true education, and um, it is, uh, it's a real insight into what it takes from that side of the administration, but it also, from a council perspective, um, it, it's a great insight into how we can either be partners to get a lot done, which I'm very proud of the way that Southwest Ranches runs it and does that, um, or we can be a weapon of, of, of destruction and disorientation and, um, and really destroying what otherwise is an amazing town. So um, it's, it's a great book. I encourage everybody to, to read it if you, get a, if you get a chance. And thank you, Andy, for sharing it with me. Great, great read. All right, and, uh, Gary. Motion to, no. <laughs> Motion to approve. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. I threw him off. All right, thanks. All right, good night, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Good night, folks. Good night, Gary. Uh, David. <laughs> <laughs>